we are finally going back to what made this channel popular in the first place and that is domain driven design. In this video we're going to do a domain modeling exercise where I'm going to show you a diagram of a sample domain model and we're going to convert this domain model into classes in our project by applying domain driven design principles. So here's how our domain looks like and as you can probably guess it's going to be an eShop application the aggregates are orders, products and customers with their respective entities and we're going to be converting this domain model into our project by creating some classes that are going to represent these entities. We're going to be using domain driven design principles and some tactical patterns like aggregates, entities and value objects to design our initial domain model and then we're going to see how we can impose some constraints into our domain model to make it nicely encapsulated. I'm starting out from an empty solution with a domain project inside and now we're going to start modeling our domain. So let's start off by creating three distinct feature folders that are going to contain our aggregates. So if you recall from our diagram we had the orders aggregate, we also had the products aggregate, and we also had the customers aggregate. So I'm going to create these three feature folders that are going to encapsulate our distinct entities and the other behaviors that we want to introduce into our domain model. By organizing your domain model around features or aggregates, you're going to end up with a much more cohesive domain model where everything that is tightly coupled is sitting together inside of the same folder. We're going to start off by creating an entity that is going to represent our customer and let's introduce a few properties that are going to be relevant for identifying a customer. So for example we're going to add a property that is going to be our email for the customer which is going to be a string to start out and it's important that it ends up having a private setter. Let's give it a default value of an empty string. Now, what else could we add to the customer? Let's, for example, give the customer a name. So let's give it a name property. I'm going to leave it at this for now because I don't want to overcomplicate the domain model. I want to focus more on the modeling aspect. But one thing I do want to stress is that the customer is supposed to represent an entity. And an entity in domain-driven design is an object that is uniquely identifiable inside of the domain. So we need a way to differentiate between two customers. Now, for example, if we impose a constraint in our domain that the email has to be unique, then we can use this value as the identifier of our customer, but it's going to become cumbersome if we start referencing the customer in our domain in other entities by using the email. So in that regard, we usually introduce an ID that is going to identify our entity. And for the ID, let's use, for example, a GUID value, which is going to uniquely identify our customer. We're also going to give it a private setter for now. And let's see what we did here and why we did it like that. I said that the customer is supposed to be an entity, which is why I introduced an ID that is going to uniquely identify this customer inside of our domain model. The ID is also going to allow us to reference this entity from other entities or aggregates inside of our domain model. Another thing I want to highlight is that all of our setters are private. This is because we don't want the entity to be changeable outside of the scope of the customer class. So if we want to change the email or the name of the customer, we're going to do that inside of the customer class by exposing some method on our entity that the application layer can call and then apply the respective change. That's enough about the customer. Let's also create the product entity. We're going to need this one for the order aggregate later, so I'm creating it right away. So for the product entity, we also want to have a GUID ID like we did with the customer. Let's also give it a private setter. And let's see what we need to add here. So one thing that we certainly want to have is the name of the product. I'm going to add that right away. Another thing that we need in the product is a way to represent the price. 
and also this queue. So let's start off by modeling the price. The price has two distinct components and it actually represents money. So we need a way to encapsulate the currency and the amount of that money instance to be able to represent the price of a product. So one thing that we can do is we can create a record that is going to represent money. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to create the record in the same file and then I'm going to move it into its own file. So it's going to be a public record money and it's going to have a currency value which I'm going to model as a string right now and a decimal value for the amount. In domain driven design when you have an object that is only identifiable by its values we call that a value object. So for two value objects to be equal they need to have the same values. In the case of money the values are the currency and the amount. So two money objects are equal if their currencies are the same and the amounts are identical. The good thing about records in C Sharp is that they have structural equality by default. So they are a good candidate to represent value objects in our domain. So let's use the money value object to represent the price of our product. So let's say public money price and this is going to represent the price of our product. Structural equality is one property of value objects that we are interested in and another property that is important is immutability and records also satisfy that because they are immutable by design. So they are a perfect candidate to represent value objects in our domain and they are also very concise because we can represent an entire record in just one line of code by using the primary constructors feature. So another thing that I mentioned that I want to represent on the product is the concept of a skew. So let me create another record for the skew and it's only going to have a string value. Now if you're not familiar, skew stands for stock keeping unit and it's just another way to uniquely identify a product in some e-commerce application. One thing that you can do with value objects is you can enforce some constraints by encapsulating how the object can be created. So for the stock keeping unit or the SKU, let's say we want to follow a certain format that the value of the SKU has to follow. So I'm going to actually create a factory method that is going to allow us to create a new SKU instance. So let's call it public static SKU create. It accepts a value. So this is just a factory method that you call by calling SKU.create. One thing that's breaking encapsulation of our value object is that we are exposing the value inside of the primary constructor. So I'm going to get rid of it from here and I'm going to introduce the value as a property in our SKU record and it's going to have just a getter without any setters because we want it to be immutable. Or you can also add an init setter so that as soon as the value is set it cannot be modified. So let's leave it like this and let's create a private constructor for the SKU which accepts a value and it's going to just set the value property on our record. So we're going to use this private constructor from the create factory method to be able to actually initialize a new SKU instance. So this approach is something that you will commonly see in domain driven design because it helps you ensure that whenever you create an object it can only be instantiated in a valid state. So let's introduce a few values for validating our SKU. Let's say if, for example, it is a null or empty string, then it is not a valid SKU, and we're going to return null. So let's add another rule that the length of the SKU has to be exactly 15 characters. So we're going to say if the value is, for example, not equal to 15, then we're going to say validation failed and return null. All right, now magic numbers like this, of course I missed value length here. So magic numbers like this aren't very representative. So what you can do is you can introduce a constant in your value object that is going to represent what 15 actually means. 
So let's say default length is equal to 15. And we're going to use this constant when validating our SKU length. Let's say that this is it for the validations and we just return a new SKU instance in the end. So let's use this value object in our product by introducing another property that is going to represent the SKU. And this is what our product entity would look like, for example. So let's move this into separate classes to make it easier on us. And let's move to the last aggregate that we have. And this is the order aggregate. So of course, we're going to add it in the orders folder and it's going to be just an order entity. So this is an entity. So of course, the first thing that we are going to need is to have an ID to identify this entity in our domain. So let's add that ID. And now let's see what we need on our order. We need a way to reference the customer entity that is also part of our domain model from the order entity. You can't directly store another entity in your domain model, but you can store a reference to that entity by using a foreign key. So we're going to add a GUID right here that is going to be the customer ID. And this is going to be the identifier of the customer entity that we created at the start. So another thing that the order needs is the line items. Now for that, I'm going to create a simple object, which is going to be the line item. And let's see what we want to create inside of the line item. The line item can be treated as an entity, but it can also be treated as a value object, depending on what you want to do. I'm going to treat it as an entity and I'm going to give it its own ID. So let's give it the ID, which is going to be a GUID value and it's going to represent the line item ID. Another thing that the line item needs is the order ID that owns this line item. So let's give it the order ID. One more thing that we want to introduce here is the product ID, which is also going to be a GUID. And this is going to point to the product entity, which this line item represents. One thing that makes common sense in an eShop application is to detach the price of a product from the price of a line item because the price of a product can change over time but the price of a line item is only valid at the time of creation so i'm going to add one more property here which is going to be a money value object and it's going to be the price now you can see that we define the money value object inside of the products feature folder, but we are using it again from the orders feature folder. This means that money represents something that has meaning inside of our entire domain. It makes sense to move it in some sort of a shared folder that all of the feature folders can reference. So this is just something to think about. I'm going to leave it like this for now because I don't think it introduces any problems inside of our domain model. So we created our line item and now we're going to use it in the order entity. So I'm going to create a private read-only field that is going to store my line items. I'm going to make it a hash set just to make sure that all of the line items are unique. And I'm going to name it line items. Now we can instantiate it even to a default empty hash set. And now what you want to do is you want to encapsulate the adding or removing of line items inside of the order entity. So the way to do that is by exposing methods to be able to do something like that. So let's say we have a public void method of add. This method can accept two things. One can be a line item, but another thing can be a product. So let's say that we want to accept a product. The question is, do we want to reference a product directly or do we want just the product ID? Now, if we were to pass in a product ID, this would be a GUID value. And it's not very clear what that GUID represents. But when you expose a method accepting a product entity, then it becomes very clear what you want inside of your method. So let's start off by creating the line item. And now the problem is, 
we don't have a constructor on our line item entity. So let's give it a constructor and we can make it private and create a factory method or I can make it internal so that it is only callable from this assembly which is our domain project and let's use this approach for example. So let's pass it all of the values that it needs to instantiate the line item. I'm going to autocomplete this using the Visual Studio AI. So now we have our constructor and now let's use it in our add method to create a new line item. So var line item is going to be a new line item and we're going to pass in the new ID by calling GUID new GUID. We're going to pass in the ID of the order from the current instance and let's pass it the product ID and the product price. So by passing it the product price like this, we are catching a point in time snapshot of the product price when this line item was created. So now when the price of this product changes in the future, the price on a line item remains unchanged. And this is a very important property in an eShop application. So now we can say line items and add a new line item. And this takes care of adding a new line item. And one more thing that could be useful is a way for us to create a new order instance. So let's go for the factory method approach where we create a new order by calling the order create method. And for this, let's say that we want to accept a customer entity so that we can associate it to the order instance. So let's create a new order. And you can see that again, we don't have a constructor. Let's create a private parameterless constructor, for example, inside of our order class that we're going to use. And we're going to now set the property values for our ID and the customer ID. And then we're going to return this order. So the ID is going to be a new good. And the customer ID will come from the customer object. And now we can return a new order instance. So these are some of the patterns that you're going to constantly see in domain driven design. So what we actually covered is the concept of an entity which is uniquely identifiable inside of your domain by some sort of unique identifier. In this case, we just used a GUID. We also talked about value objects, which are objects that are defined by their value. Value objects can also have some sort of validation built into them so that they can only be constructed with some specific state, such as a stock keeping unit, which in our domain has to have a length of 15. Now we can introduce more validations into our value object, like for example, the first three characters have to be a letter and then the remaining values in the string have to be numbers. So something like that can be part of your domain. And lastly, we talked about orders and line items. This is commonly referred to as an aggregate where you have one object that is the order in this case, which encapsulates all of the other entities and value objects belonging to that aggregate. Now this encapsulation also means that the other entities cannot be modified outside of the aggregate root. So this is why we have the add method on our order to be able to introduce new line items. We would also have methods for removing the line item and maybe even modifying the line item price and so on. I hope that you enjoyed this video about domain modeling with some tactical domain driven design patterns. We're going to be extending this model in the future videos and talking about some more concepts from domain driven design. So make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss these. And while you're here, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And until next time, stay awesome.